Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our third Connecting the Dots webinar. Today, uh, we have a great panel here with us today. I hope you, everyone had a good lunch and they're refreshed and ready to absorb all the knowledge that will be shared today. Right, so firstly, I will introduce the panel. We have Dr. Kenneth Charles. He is a consultant hematologist at the Eric Williams Medical Sciences Complex. He's also a senior lecturer in hematology at the, at the University for the West Indies St. Augustine campus. He, is all, he has also publicly spoken on many occasions about the importance of voluntary non-remunerated non blood donations. And he is very influential in the work with the UE Blood Donor Foundation, which hosts many blood drives and shares the awareness about blood donation. We also have Ms. Marian Carillo. Hi. Right, she is a member of the SISBDTT. She is also, hold on, give me one moment. Okay, she's a certified medical lab laboratory scientist who specializes in blood banking. She is certified by the American Society of Clinical Pathology and has a master's degree in clinical laboratory management from Rush University, Chicago. She has also completed a specialist in blood banking program at Rush. Previously, Marion worked at the National Blood Transfusion Service in Trinidad and Tobago, Scarborough General Hospital in Tobago, and the Eric Williams Medical Science Complex and Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania Hospital in Philadelphia. A 15 years experience in blood banking involves both the medical and academic field. Currently, as the immunohematology lecturer at COSTAT, she teaches medical laboratory students how to provide safe, pure and potent blood for patients in need of a blood transfusion. Marion is also the owner of Trinity Blood Solutions, a consulting practice that helps medical laboratory technologists advance their career regionally and internationally through continuing education and professional development sessions. As a blood banking educator, Marion has been a guest on the TV6 Morning Edition and the Now Morning Show on TTT. She has hosted numerous blood drives with Yuri Roytek, Trinity East College, and Bishop Anstey East High School. Also with us is Dr. Wayne Lavasteed. He is an immuno immunologist with a PhD from the University of Cambridge, UK who through interest, experience and a postgraduate diploma in management information systems from the University of West Indies has evolved into an information systems professional, creating solutions for public health and laboratory medicine in the Caribbean. He is also a lecturer in immunology at the University of the West Indies School of Medicine at Mount Hope. Oh, sorry. he. He has been between 2007 to 2018, and he remains concerned about what the balance between the use of pharmaceuticals and a meaningful risk management through healthier lifestyles in patient care. He also has a very long profile, but we, well, I won't go into that in the interest of time today. <laughs> so today, um, our very experienced panel is going to speak about the various reasons why blood transfusions are used in the treatment of sickle cell disease, how blood transfusions affect the body, simple, ex simple blood transfusions versus exchange transfusions, and why one method may be preferred in different circumstances. So first we have Dr. Kenneth Charles. The floor is yours. Thank you, and thank you for inviting me. I just do the, uh, those technological acrobatics you are just trying to <laughs> direct me through. Yes, it says. Great, and you could start slideshow from the beginning. Uh, slideshow, thank you very much. Okay, there we are. Am I up and running? Yes. Okay, thank you for inviting me. It's a great pleasure and it's a great honor to be here. Uh, 
It's always an honor to be speaking in, in a recognition of Dr. Charles's efforts. And um, much of my early training in hematology as a junior doctor and shortly after uh, deciding on a specialist route was guided by her. As a matter of fact, she was one who said, go, 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 go to England and don't come back until you're a judge. And uh, it meant go and become a, as a qualified as possible. And it was a very uh, good advice, which I've heeded and pass on to my the students I meet now to ensure that they uh, glean as much as possible from the system within which with miniature work while being of service to people. Having said that, so this is uh, my presentation on blood transfusion in sickle cell disease. And uh, my name is Kenneth Charles, as uh, you would have heard. And I'm here in a couple of capacities. One of them is university side. The other is the National Blood Transfusion Service side. But the proudest of them all is as a member of the Blood Donor Foundation, because that foundation was really formed to meet the needs of the hemoglobinopathy uh, patients in the country. Uh, we state that publicly now, that is what inspired it because of the transfusion needs of the hemoglobinopathy children and adults in the country. That's what inspired this, what you'll witness today or some of, what, some of which you will witness today. So you'll speak about sickle cell disease, a very brief history about the world distribution, the lab tests, that conducted the indications for transfusion, some of the complications of transfusion, the alternatives to transfusion, and end with speaking about blood donation without which no blood transfusion happens. So sickle cell disease was identified from very early on, as you could see, and identified definitively as a molecular disease in 1949, inherited. And the inheritance is all based and resides within what is called the beta chain of the hemoglobin molecule, which I imagine you would have spoken about this morning at some point. So very simply put, hemoglobin is the red material in the red cell, and it's made up of two types of chains, alpha chains and beta chains, and they're both protein chains. And it is in the beta chain that the abnormality is inherited that causes sickle cell disease. This diagram here, and is very pretty, but deliberately shown because it shows that um, while a child is growing, and I know there's a way to find a pointer. There is. There we go then. So while a child is in the womb, the, the yolk sac and then the, the, the liver and, and then eventually the bone marrow makes hemoglobin. And it makes predominantly gamma chains for a while. And these gamma chains produce hemoglobin F, F for fetus, which is a quite beneficial uh, type of hemoglobin in sickle cell disease, as you will see. But sometime in utero, the liver and then the bone marrow starts producing this other chain, the chain that is usually found in adults called the beta chain. And it was in that chain that the abnormality that causes sickle cell disease arises and is inherited. But the beta chain only becomes the leading chain after about three to six months of a uh, life outside the womb. So therefore, sickle cell disease does not cause problems until about three to six months outside the womb after birth. Because what protects against problems is the presence of this gamma chain and hemoglobin F, F for fetus, which is so important. So it prevents problems with sickle cell disease until quite uh, later on after birth. 
So it stands to reason if one could replicate this abundance of hemoglobin F in adulthood, we could in effect ameliorate all the complications of sickle cell disease. And this is the basis of all the treatment modalities. Increasing hemoglobin F to make you convert it from once a child, uh, once a man back to a child with good intentions. The word distribution of the sickle cell gene and the gene is the material within DNA that determines how proteins like hemoglobin are formed. So if one inherits a gene for hemoglobin of type sickle from one's mother and a gene for hemoglobin of type sickle from one's father, then one is what is called uh, in, in inherits uh, or the homozygous state, meaning you have two genes uh, dictating that you make hemoglobin S. So it's a double whammy and that causes clinical problems that we'll describe. As, as you can see, this hemoglobin S gene arose, arose in all the countries from which our ancestors came, the Africa, India, and the Middle East. And therefore, they made their way over here. And uh, people with hemoglobin who carried one of the genes probably survived uh, better than, than people who did not carry one of the genes because they were less likely to die from malaria. So therefore the survivors came over and there's a, a preponderance of hemoglobin S in our population. And it's both African and Indian population because it inherited the gene ar ar uh, arose in both populations. So people who inherit, who carry the gene, if two people carrying the gene have a child, the child has a 25% chance of having both genes and having SS disease. And as you will know, and may probably have been told today, it does not mean that one out of every four children will have SS disease. It means that every time one has a child, there's a 25% chance that the child will have SS disease, which is the importance of the uh, screening and uh, tracking uh, in which work uh, Dr. Charles was so uh, engaged in Tobago and which we hope to get on track through the Ministry of Health. And we'll be speaking with your associate about how we do that because it was well-intentioned work that should not allow to, to just fall off. And on behalf of the Ministry and the University, I can declare you out full support in taking that forward. So you talk about some diagnostic tests in sickle cell disease. I'll not go too much in depth with them because I know Marian will do that a lot more skillfully than I could ever hope to. So I'll touch on mostly clinical aspects of the complete blood count, the peripheral blood film, the sickle solubility test, which is still used hemoglobin electrophoresis. And I imagine Marian will speak more about these uh, slightly more technical tests, but more informative. So you complete blood count in sickle cell disease and you will see it at your clinic visits and ask about it. It tells you what your white cell count is, your hemoglobin is, your mean cell volume, that's the size of your cells and your platelets. These are the important measurements for practical purposes. The white cell count in a sickle cell disease patient may appear elevated and that is because there's chronic Damp tissue damage ongoing, so the count rises as a reaction. So it doesn't necessarily mean infection. It just means ongoing hemolysis. That means ongoing breakdown of red cells, ongoing inflammation because it's ongoing damage to tissue. And uh, sometimes there's superimposed infection. In addition, the white blood cell count can appear elevated because there are red cells with nuclei circulating in the blood, and they're not usually there, but they spilled out into the bone, into the blood because the bone marrow is overactive to compensate for the red cell destruction that's happening because of sickle cell disease. The hemoglobin concentration is a measurement of uh, how much hemoglobin there is in the red cell. And uh, what is called the normal value resides somewhere between 11.5 and 13.5 for females 
and 13.5 to 16.5 for males. But in persons with sickle cell disease, it often rests between seven and nine grams per deciliter. And everybody with sickle cell disease uh, breaks down red cells to a certain degree, and the body learns to live with that degree of destruction. So the level at which the body has learned to compensate and function is called a steady state hemoglobin concentration. And it is important that every sickle cell disease patient is aware of what his or her steady state hemoglobin is because it uh, could prevent panic and prevent unnecessary transfusion. And there are guidelines for transfusion that usually are centered around what the steady state hemoglobin is because the steady state hemoglobin is to be respected as a personal level at which one function and one must be aware of it and claim it to be one's own, that this is my steady state hemoglobin. Please don't transfuse me. The mean cell volume is the size of the red cell and it may be unduly reduced if sickle cell disease is inherited alongside thalassemia trait, which is very common in our population as well, and could cause a combination of sickle cell disease and thalassemia, it is called sickle beta thalassemia. And one of the landmarks is that the mean cell volume is very much reduced. Platelets may be increased in our in sickle cell disease, and that is a reaction to hemolysis. Again, it could be a reaction to inflammation as ongoing. It may be a reaction to damage to the spleen, and it's unexpected uh, finding in sickle cell disease. I don't know what the uh, format for questioning is, uh, uh, Kieran. I suppose uh, you all have this. Beg your pardon? Questions will come after. I see. Is it immediately after in a separate session? It, well, um, we, we allow all the presenters to go first and then we'll entertain a QA. Okay, that sounds very reasonable and well organized. Sure. So, what happens with sickle cell disease? Because this abnormal hemoglobin called hemoglobin S is in the red cell, it forms crystals and it damages the red cells from inside. So uh, when the red cell membrane become damaged from inside, the red, cell, the red cell folds up into this sickle shape like a cutlass and it, it loses its mobility and flexibility. Remember when it has hemoglobin A in it, it's very flexible, you know, and could travel through any small blood vessel, changes its shape and slips through and delivers oxygen from the lungs to any tissue requiring it and no small blood vessel could get in its way. However, when it is uh, impeded by the presence of hemoglobin S within it, and this membrane is damaged from within, it assumes what is called a sickle shape under certain conditions and becomes very inflexible. And instead of fighting up to, to slither through any small blood vessel, just blocks off the blood vessel and cuts off the oxygen supply to, to tissues beyond the blood vessel, which is where the chronic and acute damage comes in. So the cause of sickle cell disease is, is, is typified by this small vessel occlusion causing symptoms. And sequelae, there's hemolysis because the red cells don't live long and the spleen removes them very quickly. So they live for about 20 something days as compared to the normal red cell containing hemoglobin A, which lives for three months. There's ischemia, meaning uh, oxygen deprivation of tissue. The bone marrow becomes overactive to keep up with the, the, the red cell destruction. And because of that, it requires extra nutrients to do its work, which is why um, uh, sickle cell disease patients are prescribed folic acid. Now, locally, because our diet is so rich in folic acid anyway, we probably escape without taking it. And I, I know that uh, I... I see somebody is nodding uh, in guiltily there. But, uh, yeah, the diet probably gives us enough folic acid. But take your folic acid as prescribed anyway. The end result is anemia, meaning the hemoglobin concentration falls to the steady state. The person survives at that level. 
There can be chronic and ongoing organ damage because these small vessel occlusion is still happening. So if we could do things to prevent the sickling process, we preserve a lot of tissue. And uh, every now and then there are these disturbing crises that uh, require admission to hospital and all the un unpleasantness that, that could go with it, including the pain and the, 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 the hassle and the requirement for opiates and so on. So really, if we could arrive at some formula to prevent the need for hospitalization for crises and to provide blood transfusion for, for sickle cell disease patients in emergency crises, I think we'd have improved the quality of life in a significant and meaningful and valuable large segment of our population. And now uh, that will form the, the, the basis of, of much of what I'm going to speak about. So this person, for example, you see here was, uh, I was called about this person from the Coover facility because quite a lot of sickle cell disease patients are ending up down there. When I say quite a few, I mean, I get called two or three times per week. And the lesson here is please get your vaccines. Please get your vaccine. Sickle cell disease patients do particularly badly if they acquire COVID. Please get your vaccines. So this person was not known to have sickle cell disease. He thought he had sickle cell trait. So we will send this uh, blood film from him. And we saw that he does have sickle cell disease because this here is a sickle cell and you don't find those in sickle cell trait. Yeah? So he does have sickle cell disease. In addition, he has what are called reticular sites, which are some fairly immature red cells. This is a mature red cell here, but before it becomes that mature, it is immature and larger and has a bluish color to it. And it is called a reticular site. So if one measures these in the blood, it is a marker of the bone marrow activity. So if a sickle cell disease patient's bone marrow is working well to compensate for the red cell destruction, we see a high reticulocyte count. So if we don't see a high reticulocyte count in the presence of anemia, we know that the bone marrow is not keeping pace with the rate of destruction, which is ongoing. So it's a very valuable parameter. In addition, this young man had some red cells with nuclei in them. And these nuclei are where all the DNA and that is contained and these cells like this don't usually appear in the circulation in the bone marrow. But if hemolysis is sufficiently severe, they could spill out into the bone marrow. And then because the machine counts all the cells with nuclear as white cells, this person could appear to have a very elevated white cell count when in fact uh, this elevation is partly caused by nucleated red cells. And this is hemoglobin electrophoresis, which, with which you all are familiar. And Marian may me go into this, so I'll just touch on it. It is a means of measuring the type of hemoglobin in the cell. And it is regularly measured by separating the hemoglobin and putting it on a, a, a strip. And then with electrodes at both ends. And the different types of hemoglobin migrate along the strip in a manner that is determined by the size and the electrical charge of the type of hemoglobin and the type of strip. So that hemoglobin A migrates to a different place compared to hemoglobin S. So you can see like this person in lane six has both hemoglobin A and hemoglobin S. So they have AS or hemoglobin or sickle cell trait. This person has only hemoglobin S and has SS disease. This person has hemoglobin S and hemoglobin C. So they have SC disease, which is a milder variant of our sickle cell disease. See blood film, it shows a sickle cell here. 
and some other cells that I won't go into. That's what the cell looks before it is sickled and after. Before it, it is sickled, it goes through these small blood vessels and comes out the other side very speedily, delivering oxygen in its wake. When it's sickled, it gets clogged in the blood vessel and doesn't come out this side. So we'll be onto this tissue out here because there's no oxygen supply to it. Things that may cause sickling, you're well aware, infections, dehydration, cold, physical stress, sometimes psychological stress, sometimes there's no reason at all. It just happens. This child has a very enlarged spleen and it's called acute splenic sequestration because the flow of blood out of the spleen is prevented by the sickling process. So the spleen enlarges and pools blood there and therefore the child's hemoglobin falls very low to as low as two grams per liter and that could cause a stroke in the child. So that is why it is important. There's one very important uh, reason for transfusion, acute uh, I mean, emergency transfusion in the sickle cell is each child. And what is found that as soon as the uh, transfusion is begun, the spleen shrinks and the whole situation resolves. So emergency transfusion and immediate and available blood is very important in sickle cell disease care. Gallstones may occur because somebody's hemolysis causes concentration of bile in, in, the, uh, in, in, the, in the, the gallbladder, and then they become concentrated as stones in the bile duct and can become obstructed and cause problems requiring surgery, another possible cause for the need for transfusion. Sickle cell disease patients could develop avascular necrosis of the femoral head or the humeral head. This is here, it's just oxygen is cut off to the head of the joint there, it becomes damaged and unworkable. It causes chronic pain and disfigurement requiring surgery and blood transfusion may be required to cover surgery. This young lady, she had sickle cell disease and had acute chest syndrome. That means blood is trapped in the lung, the hemoglobin falls, the blood becomes infected. It's the main cause of death in, in adults with sickle cell disease. We try to avoid it happening. And she had this happen to her in pregnancy. And uh, she was treated accordingly. She required transfusions and so. And she was on hydroxyurea when she fell pregnant. And in this case, we, we just spoke to her and her partner. She was past three months of uh, gestation. And we thought if we could prevent another episode like this and save the mother's life during a pregnancy, because if the mother dies, the child dies. And for the past three months, there's no risk of causing the, the fetus damage. And uh, she had a lovely baby boy with no complications and her life was saved by continuing hydroxyurea throughout pregnancy because she had problematic pregnancies before with acute painful crises throughout and acute chest syndrome throughout. And we have found that uh, in more than, than two cases and people on, on our, now I'm not saying to people to, to go out, uh, the manufacturers and the guidance still recommends Yes, that one should not fall pregnant while in hydroxyurea therapy. But we are saying that if people, in case where people have fallen pregnant and have no and been known to have uh, uh, very troublesome pregnancies in the past that could put mother and child at risk, we've continued hydroxyurea after the third trimester with parental consent. Yes, and we have two such cases. But please, the guidance is that you avoid becoming pregnant while on hydroxyurea therapy. What kind of transfusions are there? They are simple top of transfusions to the steady state. And these are given if somebody is symptomatic or if the hemoglobin has fallen to more than two grams below the steady state. And this is additive, you just do it, just transfuse the blood. 
Uh, transfusions are sometimes required after stroke or to prevent stroke, which could be uh, either due to clots, the call infarct of stroke or hemorrhage that look like that, the white part there. And after stroke or to prevent stroke, transfusions could be employed. Hepatic transfusions are required if there are severe falls in hemoglobin. For example, if there's sequestration or pooling, like we showed in the spleen or in other, other organs. And then transfusions are just additive. Transfusions may be needed if that overactive bone marrow is stopped in its tracks by a viral infection, for example, the parvovirus. And then it just shuts down and the hemoglobin falls to about two or three. And then an additive transfusion is required. And within seven to 10 years, the bone marrow kicks back into activity. So it's just to tide somebody over that, uh, uh, that delicate period and the hemoglobin is very low. So transfusions may be needed in, uh, for the acute chest syndrome and immediately after a stroke. Uh, transfusion may be needed in cases of renal failure, which is not uncommon in adult sickle cell disease patients and causes a fall in the, uh, the steady state hemoglobin. So they may require transfusions from time to time, or they may respond to erythropoietin. Oftentimes they don't. In the perioperative period, it must be determined uh, when the surgery is planned, how important is the surgery, what was a person's sickle cell disease status before, if somebody has had no problems and they've had surgery before, and, and they've had two pregnancies before with no problems at all. And uh, their steady state hemoglobin is nine and they have steady state. One, knowing the patient could see them in the clinic and say, there's no problem, just go on and do the surgery. But it must be a, a collaborative process. We need to know how long is the surgery? Is it just a two minute thing? Or is it eight hours of general anesthesia? It makes a difference. So the most important thing is collaboration and it works well. And then if the teams collaborate, we go and see the patient in the ward for the uh, operative period, not to mind anybody's business, but just to make sure that the plan is being followed and that it's in the patient's best interest. And sometimes they, they like to see the hematology team as well as uh, people with whom they're familiar. So no intervention may be required, but that needs to be declared and documented. Some patients may benefit from just a top-up transfusion before, and some may require, if they a very troublesome disease beforehand, and the surgery is very complex and requires uh, six to eight hours of general anesthesia, yes, it may be decided that an exchange transfusion is done before. So it's all balancing the patient's clinical state, against the uh, requirements of the surgery. There's no fixed rule. It's always an individual thing, which is why uh, collaboration is required before. And most importantly, because after general anesthetic, there's a 25% risk of developing the acute chest syndrome. So it's very important to be not cognizant of that fact and to be vigilant for that eventuality. So these are uh, the kind of cri anemic crisis that could occur to cause the hemoglobin to fall to two grams below the steady state, the aplastic crisis that we spoke about, increasing hemolysis for any reason, for example, infection, like we saw with COVID-19 there, acute splenic sequestration we spoke about, or somebody developing folate deficiency, which we seldom, we don't see because our diet is so rich in our folate, but take your folic acid tablets as prescribed, please. So this is the aplastic crisis, a viral infection or bacterial infection. The hemoglobin falls, there's a low reticulocyte count, and it usually lasts around seven to 10 days. And the bodies, they give non-additive transfusion to tie them over the period of severe anemia. This child had acute splenic sustration. This is a study we did in 2006. We have to repeat this, you know, and see uh, what's the cause of hemoglobin of uh, sickle cell admission in hospital. I know Dr. Dilabasil is going to work on this. And I just had an uh, email this morning from one of my colleagues. So I'm on this global specialist uh, advisory group for global hematology. 
So they get involved in sickle cell care globally and I very much like to link you all up with them because we have to um, take uh, these messages international and they're quite keen to hear what's happening down here, you know? And the only way they find out is if we publish and present our findings. Uh, you know what this call was about this morning, Karen? Sure. This, this fellow is asking me, the meeting was about the time it takes to get to the first dose of analgesia for sickle cell disease patients admitted to hospital. And his words were, we, have, we are quite a long way back in achieving this. Yes? Yeah. So what we need to do is to compare our findings here and collaborate to see how we could uh, arrive at a, a conjoint approach to making life better for sickle cell disease patients not only in Trinidad and Tobago, but in England and everywhere, because I'm sure the experiences are similar and there's often a common root to every problem. What is the common root? And if we identify it down here, we could help people and help the sickle cell disease patients globally. So the important thing to do is to record our experiences and to publish them. And you all, as a first hand, I don't want to, to, to call it uh, sufferers because I know you live quite high quality, uh, high, high, high quality of life, but because you're so driven to form the society in this first place and to put on all these symposia and do all these things, it means you're highly motivated. And therefore it falls to you to change the world. Yes, it falls to you. So there are some alternatives to prevent transfusion. One of them is hydroxyurea. It is very, very, very potent. And you must not run scared of it because it transforms life. And I love you know that when it was making its advent in the 1990s in, uh, in, 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 in the United States, and I was in training in, uh, in, in Sheffield, and my first response was, no, that sounds like experimentation business. It was, I'll level with you. And then my eyes were opened and I saw the benefits to using this thing in sickle cell disease patients. I've seen it transform lives. And I've seen it not having the uh, feared side effects like causing cancer and so on. I've not seen it cause pregnancy uh, problems. And this is now uh, 25 years after it was first introduced. And I'm struggling, I'm not, I'm trying not to be too dramatic in what I'm saying, but now I personally, and you could correct me if I'm wrong in saying so, Dr. Delabesid, I question the, 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 the ethics of, of not offering hydroxyurea or advocating hydroxyurea in sickle cell disease. That's how much I've swung in 20 years, because one must change with emerging evidence. And I won't go on to recommend something which I don't believe. I won't tell it to go and, and get the vaccine if I don't know. I've seen the consequence of not having it. Similarly, I've seen the consequence of using hydroxyurea judiciously and the benefit that people derive from it. And I'm now I'm an advocate for it. I am an advocate for stem cell transplantation under very selective circumstances, not on, on, on it's a very individual and there's a lot that goes way along with it that must be in place to support it. And I'm all in favor of stem cell transplantation if everything is in place. Yes, that requires proper selection of a, uh, recipients and donors. Yes, and we can train people to do it. You know, I, mean, I think many of us have trained on transplant units and then what is required to give so much doses of that. But then what happens after one gives the required dose of, of chemotherapy to eradicate the bone marrow for replacement? And the main thing so far is we don't have transfusion services to support that phase. 
Yes? yes? And my thing is the best thing we could do for sickle cell disease and thalassemia patients in the country and for everybody, for every family, for every society is to uh, strengthen our blood transfusion services. Yes, and I know you all be uh, interested and read about CRISPR. I think I've misspelled it. It's so new. Yes. So it is gene modulation and it is it's, uh, giving this product that uh, modulates the genes that uh, produce hemoglobin F. So again, it increases hemoglobin F and uh, in effect ameliorates the consequence of sickle cell disease. Once there's hemoglobin F, it appears that everything uh, is resolved. So acute painful crises, hospital, uh, hospitalizations, everything decrease. So there'll be a lot less of this uh, conflict about receiving analgesics and so on if you're home without symptoms. Yes? Now I'm saying this to you all and you young ones because I see both sides. Huh? I know it is not a pleasant thing to be admitted to hospital for any reason. And it becomes uh, 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 even more so as disruptive to be repeatedly admitted to hospital. It is a difficult thing to be stigmatized and because pain is subjective. And uh, nobody could, could tell whether you have or don't have. And it is very easy to, to arrive at conclusions. And uh, so we, we have to be empathetic and sympathetic to both sides because their the, the arguments on either side. And my thing is the easiest thing and what you must advocate most strenu strenuously is to take medication to prevent these crises. But we have to sort out some in hospital care as well, including blood transfusions to be available in the crisis situation. So the complications of transfusion, uh, the main ones are infections, antibody formation, when one gets a transfused blood that is not exactly of one's type and iron overload, because each unit of blood uh, carries a lot of iron in it. This person has hemoglobin SS disease, SS. But you'll notice that there are no sickle cells on his blood film. None, and he has no problem. His hemoglobin concentration is 13.6, and his SS disease. And that's because he's inherited a high concentration of hemoglobin F. So he has no problems at all. So you could, we could emulate this in our treatment modalities we'll have achieved well, normalcy for sickle cell disease patients. This is our blood donor foundation. It's students and their families and their communities. And we collect blood at the Eric Williams Medical Sciences Complex uh, every three months. And it's con co collected in a voluntary and non-remunerated blood donation fashion. None of our donors collects any chit to give to anybody. None of our donors collects any credit to say, I have uh, the right to reclaim this blood, that is the policy, that is the basis of the U.S. Indies Blood Donor Foundation. And we're very proud that we've done this for six years now. We've not reclaimed any unit. We've collected over 1,500 units so far. We collect over 100 units every blood drive, and it goes into the natural blood supply for anybody needing it. Yes? So heaven forbid if you are a, a sickle cell disease patient or your thalassemia patient require transfusion. Yes, this kind of uh, blood donation behavior ensures that there's always a supply there that's available for people, whether or not able to go and recruit blood donors. As a matter of fact, the ministry is moving to remove this system of going to recruit and find blood donors over, I think, about a three or five year period. But with your support and advocacy, I think we could do it a lot sooner than that. You must become advocates of voluntary, non remunerated blood donors. We are very touched and pleased to cooperate with for World Thalassemia Day. So our people do it. You just give it and walk away. Forget it. You've given it and you want nothing in return. 
And is the best way to do it is the way that uh, is, is, is the, the, the human way, is the ethical way, it's, uh, it's moral, it's honest. And uh, so you've spoken about sickle cell disease, it's history, world distribution, lab tests, indications, complications, alternatives, and it's spoken about blood donation and the way forward. These are my references, and I thank you for the time. I really enjoyed chatting with you, and I hope you enjoyed my presentation as well. So remember, hemoglobin F and voluntary non remunerated blood donation. I thank you for your, your time and attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Charles, for that very thorough presentation. And yes, we are, as an organization, we are also firmly in support and advocate for voluntary non remunerated blood donations. Uh, you said quite a number of things here today that I hope many people with sickle cell disease will view and take into practice, such as taking your folic acid, getting the COVID vaccine, you know, uh, trusting in hydroxyurea and so on. So next, uh, we'll go straight to Marianne's presentation. Uh, please go I... ahead and feel free to submit your questions and we'll address them at the end. All right. Um, I should be able to share my screen. Or... I, uh, I, I put it okay. up here. Huh? So... Okay, thank you. So, so All right, so... Next you wanna go ahead. Okay. So thank you for this opportunity, SISBD. TT to share this knowledge with the society. Um, so for today's presentation, I will discuss the journey of the blood from the donor to the recipient. So it's from the, from the blood donor to you. The objectives in this presentation are Describe what happens after the blood is donated. State three challenges that increase the time it takes for a patient with antibodies to receive blood for transfusion. State what happens if a patient is in urgent need of blood and describe how a short supply of blood impacts patients with blood disorders. So moving on, next slide, please. All right, what happens after you donate the blood? First off, um, when someone donates blood, it's actually five containers that are being collected. And I'm not sure how many of you knew that. All right, so in this picture here, if you look closely, you would see the blood bag. All right, and right behind her hand has uh, the tubes. Okay, so those are four collection tubes or test tubes as we call them. And uh, then you have the bag that's collecting the blood. So those are the five containers. All right, so when we talk about 500 ml, it's talking about the blood that goes in the bag in addition to what is collected in the test tubes. So let me, let, let me tell you what happens with those containers. Next slide, please. This is a better look at what's taking place. So the nurse is writing up the blood bags. And in this case, she has uh, one satellite bag attached. She's writing on the other one. And you see the three red top tubes and one that is purple. So that's what will collect the blood from the donor. Next slide, please. So again, you can see that after the unit is, connect is collected from the donor, what happens is the tubing that goes to the main bag, to that big bag that everybody sees, that is cut and the bag is separated from the tubing. While the tubing is still in the donor's hand, 
that tubing is used to pour blood from the donor into the four test tubes. All right, so that's on that's in the picture on the left of your screen. The picture on your right and the right of your screen is uh, the unit, the one pint. And in this picture, there are two satellite bags attached. All right, so in some cases, the collection bag has one bag attached, one satellite bag, and in other cases, there are two. In our country, we collect plasma and plasma products from men only. All right, so you would have, so the male donors would have a bag that looks like the one on the right. Okay, they would have a collection bag and two satellite bags attached. For females, their blood bag would only have one bag attached, one additional bag. And the reason for this has to do with uh, something called trally, okay? And that stands is T-R-A-L-I, and it stands for transfusion-related acute lung injury. Now, this is this is not on the slide. Just a side note. What happens is uh, this is a transfusion reaction that can become fatal. Now, they believe one of the so it's a combination of things that has to be put together in order for a patient to develop this transfusion reaction. One important ingredient is getting antibodies from the donor, all right? And these antibodies are oftentimes developed through pregnancy. So therefore, in, instead of asking the females if they've been pregnant, what we do when we collect blood is we don't use the plasma portion of the blood that's connect, collected from a female. All right, so that additional bag, after the plasma is separated from the rest of the red cells, that will be discarded. However, if the donor is male, that plasma will be separated into platelets. All right, and as we go on, I have a short video that I'll show you how that process is done. Okay, so with the four tubes, all right, the four tubes that's collected, that goes for testing. And the tests that are done on those tubes are hepatitis B, hepatitis C, HIV, HTLV, syphilis, and trypanosoma cruzi. The other the other two tests that are done are the ABORH type and the antibody screen. Okay, now the tests, the first six tests I listed, those are tests for transfusion transmitted infections. So those are uh, serological tests that are done. If those tests are negative, then it's okay to transfuse that blood. All right, if the tests are positive, then confirmatory test has to be followed. The blood type is also done and the, the donor is also screened for any unexpected antibodies. Okay, so that's, that is what takes place with those four tubes that are collected, the four test tubes. So this is the slide that you're looking at now. It talks about, it tells us what happens to that one pint of blood. That unit or pint 
is separated into different blood components. All right, so we're staying on this slide for a little bit. And those blood components are partially packed red blood cells, plasma, platelets, and cryoprecipitate. Cryoprecipitate is made according to need because it's not used up as much, okay? Each one of these products require different storage conditions and they have different expiration dates. So for example, the partially packed cells, or these are the red cells, they are good for 35 days and they must be stored at one to six degrees Celsius. Okay, well, when transporting them, they can be transported at a little bit higher temperature, so one to 10 degrees Celsius. Okay, so at no point in time should anybody be transporting red cells in a cooler with nothing in it, especially in our hot climate. All right, something must be in there to ensure that that product is maintained at one to 10 degrees Celsius. Actually, the, the facility receiving that unit of blood, if that unit of blood is warmer than that one to 10 degrees Celsius, it needs to be tested. And then if it's out of the 10 degrees Celsius, a lot of times it should be discarded. So the transport of this product is very, very important. The transport of actually all the blood products are important, okay? With plasma, plasma is stored for 12 months. And plasma is stored in a freezer, all right? So that, freezer must be minus 18 degrees Celsius or lower. We also have platelets. Platelets are stored for five days. All right, and platelets need to be stored at room temperature, but they must be constantly agitated or in layman's terms, they have to be shaked all the time. They can't be, they can't sit still for more than 24 hours. All right, cryoprecipitate is like plasma in that it can be frozen for 12 months at the same storage conditions as plasma. So that's minus 18 degrees or lower. All right, so what are these products used for? The partially packed cells are used for, um, for helping to carry oxygen, all right? So uh, a lot of times this is the product that is more, most used, okay? It will be transfused to those who have blood disorders, um, to anybody who has a low blood count for various reasons. All right, uh, the plasma, the cryoprecipitate and the platelets, these usually have no red blood cells in them. When you look at these products, they're yellow, that straw color. And these products contain proteins and they help the patient to clot. So they help the patient to stop bleeding. All right, so for example, somebody with a, a bleeding disorder, they may need at some point in time plasma or cryoprecipitate to help them stop bleeding. All right, so now I'll move on to the other slide. All right, and on this slide, you have a picture of the, of the red, the whole blood. All right, so this is blood after it's collected from a donor and it's, it's been set aside for some time. 
And you could see the separation of the red cells at the bottom and on top is the plasma. So the plasma will be separated from the red blood cells and it is the plasma that will be used to process, to be made into the fresh frozen plasma and the platelets, which can be used for transfusion. So there's a video, but before I go into the video, I just wanna say something. Separating the blood into the various components is what allows one unit to save three lives. Okay, so oftentimes we hear, you know, donate, one person can save three lives. This is how one person can save three lives. When you donate one pint of blood, that unit is separated into its different components. And we call that ability to give different components to three different individuals, component therapy. All right, and an African-American doctor, Dr. Drew Charles was uh, the man who was responsible for developing that process. So before he started that, what would happen is that whole bag that you're looking at would go to one patient. And sometimes the patient only requires red blood cells. Okay, so that extra fluid could cause an overload of fluid with the patient and could lead to further problems in that individual. So to prevent that, it was, he thought about separating the blood into its various components. So for example, someone who only needs help with bleeding, we would give them the platelets and the plasma, all right? Because they don't need red cells. Sometimes in some cases, so for example, in trauma cases where you're losing everything, right? So say for example, somebody with multiple gunshot wound, they would require the whole blood because at that point in time, they're losing everything all at once. But for someone with, an, say for example, somebody who has thalassemia, the best thing for them would be the red blood cells. All right, so this is why and how one unit can save three different lives. So I just want to go to the video now and I will show you how that one bag is processed into the three different components. We can so, share your screen so it's it a couple. Okay. So let me share my screen. All right, my screen is coming up. And in this first part of the video, it shows you, so you don't, you don't need to hear because I will tell you, all right? It shows you how that whole blood, that picture that I was just showing you is separated into the plasma component, all right? So they take that bag and they have to put it into cups and uh, those cups are then put into a machine called a centrifuge. And the centrifuge spins those cups at a high speed in order to separate the red blood cells from the plasma. So anything that's heavy will sink to the bottom and the thing, anything that's lighter will stay on top. So you would get that separation after you centrifuge the unit. So this is what this tech is doing at the moment. All right, and as I said, you don't need to hear. So it goes into the cups. 
All right. That's the centrifuge that I told you about. He's putting it into those cups close. And it spins for a few minutes. And it stops on its own. And then he removes the cups. And you see that unit is already separated. Okay, so now he puts it into what we call a plasma expressor. He breaks the seal. That seal has to be broken in order for the plasma to go into the other bags. And the other bags must be weighed because it has to be a certain amount of plasma going into them. So that's how the plasma is separated from the red cells. You want to leave some of the plasma in the red cells because that has the nutrients for the red cells to survive. All right. So, that will be set aside as the red cells. And I just want to show you another part. So that's how you get the red cells. Okay, so I'm just going to skip along to show you the, um, the platelet separation. All right, so let me... So now that he has, he would have had the plasma product, plasma separated in two bags, well, in one bag and another attach. It goes into the centrifuge again. This time is spun at a higher speed than the first time. You see, those are the two bags. So in that bag has the plasma and platelets. He breaks the seal here and the plasma goes into one bag and the platelet stays in this bag. Now platelets are pieces of cells, so they are heavier. So they would stay at the bottom of one bag and the plasma, the protein portion will be expressed into the second bag. All right, so that's how you get the plasma and the platelets, all right? And as I said, platelets have to be constantly shaken, okay? Or agitated as we see in the blood bank. All right, so in the next screen that I'll skip to, you would see where he's putting it into that platelet agitator. That's it there. All right, so the platelets are kept for five days. After five days, if nobody uses it, it has to be discarded. In the same manner, if after 35 days, nobody used the blood, it has to be discarded and so on and so on. All right. This is the freezer where the FFP or fresh frozen plasma is kept. All right. And um, so this video goes on asking you questions, etc. But that is... Uh, more or less, one more thing I want you to see before I move on is how they thaw the plasma, all right? So this is the plasma there, the frozen product is going into a water bath that is at 37 degrees Celsius and is thawed because the patient will not be able to use 
something that's frozen. All right, so this is why it has to be thawed. So when somebody orders plasma, it will take, you know, it will take some time for us to get it together because it has to be thawed at 37 degrees. The thawing process does not take long, but after it's thawed, if it's not used within 24 hours, it has to be discarded. All right, so oftentimes we want to make sure that the patient will receive, will actually be transfused and is ready to be transfused with that plasma before we put it into the water bath. All right, um, so, that is for that. I can, I can go ahead and share my screen. All right. Um, let's see here. So this was the last one. All right. Okay. So. The next slide shows you other things that happen with the, with the blood. Okay, so here you see, um, let me see if I can get. Okay, so, sorry, this is not what I want. So this is, um, this is a picture here of the, one of the texts going to get ready to put the blood into the buckets or cups. And you can see the cups here, those black containers, all right? And what she's doing is she's just stripping them. So this is a tubing. And at the end of this tubing would have been the needle that was connected to the donor's arm. Now she's stripping that. She's using something like a clamp and holding, clamping down on the tubing and pushing all the blood in that tube back into the bag, and then she has to invert it a few times. So you make sure that the unit is properly mixed. All the blood in there has to be properly mixed. All right, this is when, um, this is why when a donor starts to bleed, you would notice the nurse starts to shake up the bag because the, the bag has something called an anticoagulant. And that is necessary for the blood not to form one big clot or clump. All right. So um, once it's finished, once she's finished stripping and mixing it, she'll put it into the buckets and then it will go into the serifuge and be spun. This here on the right of your screen is uh, the tech processing or preparing leuco-reduced red cells, okay? And leuco comes from leukocyte, the white blood cells, all right? And she's removing white blood cells from these red cells. So you would see the, the blood type already written on them, all right? And if you go down here, you would see there's a, something like a, like a lady's compact, like uh, makeup, all right? And that is the leukocyte filter. So the leukocytes get, well, they're stuck in there and you have blood coming out of the other end, going into these bags at the bottom. All right, so the bags at the bottom will be leuco-reduced red cells. So this is one way and I, I believe a more efficient way of achieving leuco-reduced red blood cells. The other way would be to spin. So after the blood is prepared, you would put it back into the serifuge, that big instrument, into those cups, and you would serifuge it and then let that drip. So 
a dripping process would take place. There would be no filter attached, all right? But once the red cells reaches to almost the plasma, the bag will be disconnected. Okay, the difference with that is number one, that takes a lot longer if they have no filters. Okay, so that may be a reason why it would give, you may have a longer wait if you're going to receive a transfusion and they have no filters, it would take longer. In, um, also, when they have no filters and they do it via that, that uh, drip process through the centrifuge, what happens is that you don't have the plasma going into the bag. And as a consequence, the red cells in there now have a shorter lifespan. They are good for 24 hours only. When we use the filters, the, the plasma will go into the bag. So the, these units, the expiration date will not change. All right, the expiration date will stay the same as 35 days. Okay, and um, this is most times it's done before it goes into the refrigerator. However, it can be done after, but it's best to do it before it goes into the refrigerator. Now, white blood cells are removed because white blood cells are the components in your blood that takes care of the bacteria, okay? They have different, each type of white blood cell has a different function, but many of them in layman's terms will eat the bacteria. Okay, and if you're somebody who's immunocompromised, you don't want these white cells that have ingested bacteria into your system. So you need to get rid of them. Also too, there are other things called cytokine, um, different chemicals these white cells will produce that have ingested bacteria that could cause fever. All right, so we want to get rid of those. And uh, actually in North America, all their RBCs, or when I was there, just before I left, almost all of their RBCs were lupo-reduced. By now, I believe all are. In Trinidad and Tobago, I don't believe we have all our units lupo-reduced just yet. All right. Um, when I worked in the blood bank, there was an issue with getting the filters. So we didn't always have a steady supply of filters coming in. So if we didn't do the filter, we didn't use the local filters, we would have to use the, uh, the drip method that I explained earlier. All right, so next slide. Now it's ready for use. Okay, so once the testing is done, this. once the testing is done on the red cells with the test tubes, now the types are put on the blood. Okay, so you see in this picture here, this ARH positive. Before the testing is completed, those units are in quarantine. So we have separate refrigerators where we would put the units that whose testing is not complete. Any unit who um, the who's positive for any transfusion transmitted infection, those units will be discarded. All right. And the donor would be informed by the medical director. All right. So once we have the other units that are okay to transfuse, we would now put the labels on them and put them into inventory. Inventory would be a refrigerator or freezer or the agitator of blood products that can be used for any patient in need. In order to receive a unit of blood, a cross match would have to be formed. It would have to be performed, sorry. And to perform this cross match, we would need a requisition form all right, on that requisition form or request form, 
the patient's demographics must be completely filled out and we must have a blood sample. The blood sample can be collected in a red top or purple top tube. Okay, it depends on the type of test that's being done at that institution or the type of method using to do the test in that institution. Okay, so some institution use an automated method which would require a purple top tube and other institutions will use the test tube method that can be done with a red top tube. Okay, now I have here in red and I want to emphasize that the demographics on the request and on the test tube must match each other. This is important because when these don't match, that is a criteria for the blood bank to reject the sample. Now we have to reject the sample because in the blood banks, getting somebody's type correct is important. Okay, so we don't want a test tube saying Margaret William and the transfusion request saying Margaret Williams and think, oh, it's not, not a problem and the phlebotomist or whoever drew the tube could just come and add an S. No, we don't want that to happen because it may indeed be that there is a Margaret Williams and a Margaret William, and those two patients could be in the same room, okay? And it may be since there's an error on that, who knows if there's an error with the blood in the tube. So anytime the tech in the blood bank notice any form of discrepancy between the request form and the blood sample, that is a reason for rejection. Unfortunately, in a case like that, the sample must be redrawn. So um, just, just a word of caution as something to pay attention to if you can, just ensure that whoever is, in, is drawing your blood for your cross match, Confirm with them that they have the right spelling on the request and on the test tube. Okay. Moving on. Not sure why it's not going forward. Hold on. Okay, here we are. So, so the cross match is only part of pre-transfusion testing. Pre-transfusion testing involves clerical checks. The clerical checks will be ensuring that the request matches the sample, what's written on the sample. Also to the clerical check would be pulling the patient's history card. So once you start using blood or you even have your blood type done at the hospital, the blood bank or the transfusion service is supposed to have your blood type on file. Okay, and this is what we would use to compare your current sample with your type previously, because generally people don't change their blood types. Rare cases where people have a bone marrow transplant, you know, you would have issues like that. But generally here, people, your blood, whatever you're born with, that's what you will have until you leave this in. Okay, so um, the other thing that is done in pre-transfusion testing is performing the ABO and RH. So the test tube, you know, we, we use the plasma portion and the red cells, and we do different tests on them to determine your blood type. The next 
test we do is an antibody screen. Now, an antibody screen isn't always performed in the institutions here. Um, I know in Tobago, they do antibody screens when they do, before they do their cross match. I am not sure about the transfusion services in Trinidad. I doubt very much. Um, they do a different type of cross match. Okay, but not doing the antibody screen is okay. It doesn't mean that, you know, the, the something has not been, something is missing or it doesn't jeopardize what you're getting in any way. The, if the patient has an antibody, we have to find out what the antibody is. And then we need to confirm that the patient does have that antibody. Okay, I will come back to antibodies in a, little bit. After we find out the patient's blood type, if the patient, we find out that the patient has or does not have an antibody, and if they had an antibody, we find out the name of that antibody. Now we have to choose red cells that would match the patient. Okay, in the case where the patient does not have an antibody, if the patient is ORH positive, we will choose ORH positive to transfuse that patient. All right. And the last part of the pre transfusion testing is the cross match and, the, and reserving the unit. The cross match involves taking a segment or a sample of that unit and mixing that with a portion of the patient's plasma. All right, so we put those two things into a test tube and we mix them together and we determine if there's no clumping or the correct technical term in the blood bank is agglutination, hemagglutination. But for layman terms, if there's no clumping, then we will consider that unit to be compatible with the patient. If the unit is compatible, the next step will be to reserve it for that patient. So if the patient needing the unit of PAC cells is Marion, we will ensure that Marion's demographics are written on the bag along with the, the uh, word compatible and whoever did the, the compatibility testing should have a signature next to it or their name should be on it, all right? So um, that in a nutshell is what is involved in pre-transfusion testing. And again, pre-transfusion testing is a series of tests, but also protocols that must be followed in order for the patient to receive safe blood. All right, um, so in this next slide, I'm not sure why my slide isn't going forward. Let me try again. So in this next slide, this is the segment that I spoke to you about. That tubing that the tech was stripping earlier is sealed with uh, something hot. All right, this is plastic. Okay, so we have a sealer um, and it burns with heat. It's able to seal this, that uh, strip of blood into small samples. So this tech is cutting one of those samples to add it to the tubes that's in this rack and then do the cross match. All right. So generally from the time we receive the sample for cross match to the end, providing the patient has no antibodies, it should take us at least one hour. All right, if the patient has antibodies, it will take us much longer than that. 
All right. If the patient needs uh, leuco reduced PAC cells, again, it will be the hour plus preparation of the leuco reduced, unless they or the lab already has leuco reduced PAC cells ready for use. Okay. So at least an hour is normal or routine turnaround time for a cross match without. Um, any antibodies or any special requests. Now, I want to go over antibodies to ensure that we truly understand the difference. Because um, antibodies are a general term. And uh, we normally have blood group antibodies, all of us, okay? Unless you're A, unless you're AB, that's a different story. In this example, this individual is blood type A. So the type of blood you have is determined by the antigens or protein on your red cell, okay? So this, this the red cells of this individual, they have A on them. So therefore, this person is blood type A. Now, because this person is blood type A, they would have B antibodies, okay? And we call these naturally occurring antibodies. And this is specific for your blood, okay? So when I say antibodies, I'm speaking specifically about blood group antibodies, because as I said, antibodies are a general term. And antibodies is your body's response to something foreign. So anytime your body is exposed to something that they don't have, your natural reaction would be for your immune system to develop a defense. And part of that defense are the antibodies. However, with ABO blood group system, the antibodies are developed, we say naturally, okay? So this person did not have to be exposed to B red cells in order to develop B antibodies, okay? They have A, anti A antigens, A proteins on their red cell, or sorry, in this case, these are carbohydrates, they have A antigens on their red cells, okay? And naturally, they produce B antibodies. And this is what Carl Lanziner, he discovered this in the early 1900s. And uh, June 14th was the day of his birthday and uh, is now recognized as World Blood Donor Day. Now, before he discovered this, you would have people transfusing each other and they could, it could end up, you know, in murder. Actually, in some parts of the world, before they knew anything about blood group antibodies, transfusing an individual was a crime and it was banned. All right, so thanks to Carl Landsteiner, we now know that if you're A, you would have B antibodies. If you're B, you would have A antibodies. And so therefore, if you're O, you don't have A or B antibodies, sorry, A or B on your red cells, you would have the antibodies for whatever is not on your red cells. Okay, so as I said, these are naturally occurring antibodies. Sometimes there are antibodies that are unexpected. Okay, and this is a common case. And this is why I'm using it as an example. People with D on their red cells, D antigen on their red cells, are called RH positive. Okay, so remember if you have the 
the antigen on your red cells, you will not have the antibody. Your body doesn't need to make a defense against something it has. So there will be no D antibodies. So RH positive people have no D antibodies. But an RH negative person does not have those D antigens on their red cells. But they will not have the D antibodies either. Okay, and this is because all the other blood groups, you have to be exposed to the antigen in order to develop antibodies. All right, so in order to develop D antibodies, or what we will call anti D, this patient will have to be exposed to red cells with D on them. So if the RH negative individual is never exposed to D red cells, they would not develop any anti-D or any antibodies against D red cells. All right. Now, let's see what happens when they... So this person will not have the anti-D until they're exposed to the D red cells. So you see, they're now exposed to D red cells here. And the body takes some time to develop those antibodies, to develop, to mount a defense. Okay, so the first exposure is not likely to cause any problems. All right, so if I am RH negative and there's no RH negative blood for me, so they had to give me positive and that can happen sometimes. It usually happens more with men than females. And um, it had the reason for that is because with females, the likelihood of getting pregnant and those antibodies causing problems in the pregnancy is very high risk. So if there's no RH negative red cells for a male patient, it, and the male patient desperately needs those red cells, it's very likely that they would give the male patient RH positive, but not so with a female of childbearing age. All right, so, if that should happen, and they do transfuse the RH negative male with D red cells, the male will now develop, sorry. So the male will now develop anti-D. And these anti-D will attack these red cells and destroy them. And this is what we call a hemolytic transfusion reaction. So, Remember your antibodies, these antibodies are your defense mechanism. The body realized we don't have D and we don't want D. So let's develop this defense, the anti-D, and we will destroy these red cells. Unfortunately, these are red cells that you needed to carry to help increase your oxygen carrying capacity. So it will do you no good. And for this reason, an antibody screen is done or, or an extended cross match is done. This is why we can't just take blood that is of the same ABO and RH type and just put it into another person. We have to do a cross match. We have to ensure that the patient does not have these unexpected clinically significant antibodies. These antibodies are unexpected because again, the person has to be exposed before they develop them. Unlike the ABO antibodies that are naturally occurring, okay? So when the, we do the antibody screen is in the literal sense, we're looking to see if the patient has any unexpected clinically significant, they're clinically significant because they can destroy red blood cells. 
from donors. Okay, so the antibody screens make sure that there's none of those. But if it should come up, then we have to find out what it is. All right, and after finding out what it is, we would do another test to, to, to confirm that it is indeed that. All right, so that's in a nutshell what uh, the antibody story is. Now, when somebody has an antibody, it takes a lot longer to get the blood ready. And uh, the next slide will show you the challenges we get as techs in the transfusion service when a person has antibodies. So these are challenges with antibodies. All right, so some of the challenges we face is lack of training to resolve an incompatible cross match. So again, most times there's no antibody screen that's done. So they would do, we would do the ABORH and then go to the cross match. And if the cross match uh, is positive or incompatible, and that is evident by the clumping of the red cells or hemagglutination, you need to know what to do next. You need to troubleshoot because it could be incompatible for many other reasons than the presence of antibodies. And the tech needs to understand this. So the tech has to be properly trained in knowing that, okay, something is wrong here. Let me go through these steps to see exactly what that problem could be. It may indeed be that it was human error. And yes, these things happen sometimes because we're, we're humans. Okay, so it may be that, you know, the patient is um, oh, RH positive and in your hurry of doing other things, you picked up an A. And when you cross match, you mix the A cells with the O, they don't match. Okay, so it may be as simple as that. So you would just, you know, put back the A and pick up an O and go ahead with that. So lack of training is, is an issue. Um, resources is another issue. I have worked in institutions and I am still hearing about institutions where they don't have the reagents to do the test. All right. Um, so that is a management issue. That's something out of our hands, but it, it, it does cause problems. The other challenge is the unavailability of blood. So let's say you have properly trained techs and you have reagents for testing. The other issue is not having the blood. So after you do everything right, now you have nothing to choose from. So the patient is waiting and these are challenges that can make the wait much longer than it needs to be. The issue with training, that can be resolved if uh, a proper training program is put in place, okay? Um, we don't have one just yet. The resources for testing, there must be a standing order and there must be, I think, more, more emphasis on the seriousness of reagents for patient testing. I think more, a lot of times, maybe management would use the money to buy other things that they deem necessary as opposed to this reagent needed for these testing. Another reason they, they may not put money into it is because not many people develop antibodies. Okay, so um, it's a situation where you get you would buy the reagents and then the reagents expire in a short space of time because these reagents are made from human red blood cells. So they have a short expiration date. They are good for less than a month, okay? A lot of times about two to three weeks, okay? And you need to get a new batch every month. 
So if the institution maybe realize that, you know, we're buying this, spending so many thousands on this every month and we're not using it, then that is likely to be something that they're no longer going to spend money on. Okay, but um, in terms of quality and serving the patient, uh, the, the mindset has to change. All right, concerning that. The unavailability of blood is something we can take care of if we get more people to donate. All right, so let me go on to the next slide and I'm almost through. It went back, sorry. Okay, urgent need and short supply. I saw this today on Twitter actually and was surprised by it. It, um, this is from Southern California. Let me move this so you could read it. And it says critical blood shortage, please donate today. We don't have enough blood to help patients and we need help in 70 years. We've never seen a blood shortage like this one. 70 years, seven zero. All right, and I, I keep seeing this all throughout the world. Of course, our blood supply situation in Trinidad is worse, but as a, well, COVID is definitely a big reason, okay? Um, nevertheless, the blood supply, people donating blood has unfortunately in some parts of the world have, have decreased uh, based on the different things that I've been reading and uh, different people throughout the world that I speak with. It, many techs are now, you know, not sure what to do because we're the ones who are directly faced with it. When you're in the lab and you get a request saying, you know, I need two units for this patient. And you turn to your refrigerator and there are five units, but none of those units match your patient's type. It's, you know, there's nothing for us to do. It's out of our hands, but we feel for the patient because oftentimes we, this is a patient who get, who is multiple, who's a multiply transfused person. So you see the, the name every month or every few months you see the name. So you kind of get to know this individual by the name and then they come for the blood and you have no blood to give them. And it's, it's, it is really heartbreaking. All right, uh, there's really nothing for us to do. In terms of an emergency, what happens is uh, whatever is there, once is the type, the patient can get it once the cross match is compatible. So these are things we have to think about on that side of, of the, the blood, all right? Many, many of you are on the receiving side. On the giving side, the technical aspect, you have to consider the correct type. You have to consider whether or not it matches. Okay, so as I said, it might be the right ABO type, but because of antibodies, you can't give this A person A blood because this A blood has an antigen against your antibodies. All right, so again, the main thing to prevent this is uh, just getting, well, one thing we can control, I should say, that will help the situation is getting more people to donate blood. All right, so not sure why this is not moving. All right, so each of us have the power to increase the blood supply. We can encourage others to donate. One thing I want to remind you guys of, don't, please don't encourage people to donate. And when they ask you about donating, you don't know. You don't even know the criteria. If you're going to ask somebody to donate, at least know the general criteria. At least tell them where to go to, okay? Be nice about it. Remember you're asking, you, this is worse than asking for money. I believe people will quicker give you money than give you their own blood. So when somebody 
has that generosity to share part of themselves with anybody, it is a big deal. And I think more emphasis should be shown towards that. We should highlight the people who who doing it. We should encourage people from young to, you know, aim to be a blood donor as soon as you reach a certain age. And that will help to increase our blood supply. And once our blood supply is increased, we would have more to choose from. And the wait can be shortened, okay, for receiving blood. If you can donate, donate as frequently as you can. However, pay attention to your health. Some people donate every three months without eating properly. I'm a blood donor and I only donate every two months because my hemoglobin usually on the lower side. I'm not anemic, but I like to stay around 12. Okay, so at least twice a year, I'll make my deposit. Um, the problem with, as a regular blood donor, if you don't pay attention to your health and your iron stores, which we do not test when you're donating blood, what we test is hemoglobin, okay? We don't test your iron, but the hemoglobin is an indirect check of your iron, okay? Um, you need to pay attention to how you're feeling. Oftentimes we lose donors because donors after a while say, no, nah, that the doctor tell me I can't donate again because my iron too low. Well, there's something you could do to, to help that. Okay, so if you intend to be a frequent donor, take care of yourself, please. And uh, that's it. So thank you everybody for your attention. Uh, the Blood for All in TT is a page that I um, in charge of, and you could get more information about blood donation and blood transfusion there. Thank you. Thank you so much, Marion. A lot of insight into blood and blood donation and the components were given there. And I hope we all could take, learn, we learned a lot from this. Uh, I know we're out of time, please, uh, running out of time, but please bear with us. Uh, next, we have Dr. Lavasti, who will speak about the history of the blood transfusion service. I'm sorry to ask you, but if you could keep it somewhat yes, brief. It, it will be brief. <laughs> There's no problem with that. And I'll, I'll try to do it as quickly as possible as well. Now, this is a history of the blood of the National Blood Transfusion Service in Trinidad and Tobago. And I'm not talking about a research history here. This is an account of a direct relationship with the, the blood transfusion service that spans many decades, and in particular, a relationship with one Dr. Waveney Patricia Charles, and how uh, that has impacted a lot of what happened with the blood transfusion service over the years. Now, we hear about blood shortages now. Back in those days, and I'm talking about late 1990 to early 1991, when I joined the situation as a, a brand new, uh, spanking new immunologist, now out of training, um, joining the team at Port of Spain General Hospital. And the, in those days, it wasn't known as the National Blood Transfusion Service. It was just the blood bank. And it literally was two rooms upstairs in the laboratory block of the, of the Port of Spain General Hospital. There was a technical director who was a hematologist, um, uh, administrative manager and two nurses um, who did all the phlebotomy and everything. Uh, there were two blood bank fridges and one freezer and two phlebotomy chairs. And, and that basically was it. So the, the admin stuff happened in one room, the technical and, and medical stuff happened in the other room. And this arrangement, the blood bank was right next door to the hematology lab because they did all the cross matching and, and the, the blood type testing and, and so on. And just next to that was the, the brand new immunology unit, which is a very small, narrow, almost a corridor, not much wider than a corridor. So it, it was about 10 foot by 20 feet and there were 11 of us working inside there. Now, Dr. Charles was extremely pleased when we arrived in that situation because we were able to help her take a lot of what was needed in immunohematology and blood banking to another level. Um, there were nine of us trained as immunologists at that time, and immunology was a brand new science in those days, talking about 90, early 1990s here. Yeah. Um, so 
some of us had, you know, were either straight out of university or had laboratory backgrounds. Two were, were clinicians, one a, a pediatrician. So they were more or less the interface between the laboratory side and the, and the, and the medical side. And uh, two university technicians. So we left of us in this room. Now, Professor McFarlane was in charge of that unit. And we had the privilege and the challenge of being mentored by people like Professor Mark Bartholomew, um, Waveney Charles, um, Professor McFarlane. McFarlane gave us a, a simple mandate. He never told the doctors no. So whatever they wanted to do, whether it could be done or not at the time, he would come to us and say, figure out how to do this, the doctors are waiting. Uh, so we had to go do the research, set it up based on our training and our experience. So we were able to actually bring a lot of new diagnostic services. So as far as the immunohematology and the blood banking was concerned, we were able to take the typing of the blood at a different level. People who have frequent transfusions, as Marin has mentioned, the, the ABO matching is not enough. There are whole lots of other red cell antigens that are, become important when you get frequently transfused. You know, Kel, Duffy, Kid, Lutheran, Lewis, and a whole bunch of other stuff most people will never hear about. Um, if you get the occasional transfusion, you may not have to match for all of these, but when you get frequently transfused, every time you get a transfusion, you might make antibodies to these things. So it's important to check for them and, and make sure that people you know, will not be developing antibodies and which gives you fewer and fewer options every time they have to get a transfusion. So we were able to help with those kinds of things. It was the beginning of the HIV era. We were now recognizing the syndrome and that is even before we knew that it was a virus and what the virus was all about and so on. So we were able to help um, uh, Professor Bartholomew do his early research. Uh, because of Dr. Charles, we have Patricia Charles, our blood bank was one of the first in the English speaking Caribbean, if not the first to implement routine screening for HIV as soon as it became available within the blood bank uh, system. Uh, similar goes for HTLV-1, which is the virus that, that causes the human T-cell leukemia and lymphoma. Um, among the other collaborations, this, this arrangement between immunology and, and hematology and blood banking was a marriage made in heaven because Dr. Charles was treating her leukemias and, and lymphomas and so on. We were able to bring technology to help her with the diagnosis and classification of those leukemias and lymphomas. And she used that information to, uh, increase the, the, the survival rates, particularly in the children um, uh, suffering with these, these conditions and so on. So uh, we also brought the technology to do um, the matching, the tissue typing to make the blood trans, not the blood transfusion, but the, the organ transplant program feasible in Trinidad and Tobago. So all of these things are, are, I'm putting on the table to give you some of, of the history of, of the role of the, the National Blood Transfusion Service and, and how it evolved. Now, in those days of the blood bank, as we called it at the time, uh, shortages of blood were, were practically unheard of. Even with this very small operation with few people, it operated as a national service and, and it served everybody's uh, purposes quite adequately. Um, the technical staff in that lab, the hematology lab that served the blood bank were personally mentored and trained by Dr. Charles and they are still, those, those who are still in laboratory uh, service actively on the bench are still among the best technologists and technicians we, we, we could have had in the country at any time. Um, many of them have been known to be, to be managers of labs and so on. Some have, have moved up and out overseas managing. Um, some have moved out of laboratory medicine altogether into other things. Uh, um, but, you know, we had, we had a reputation for being spot on with our quality and so on in the administration of, of and the blood transfusion issues and the, the identification of, of difficult to find antibodies and all sorts of things. So the immunology and the, and the blood banking and the hematology work very closely together. Now, what happened? What changed over the years uh, to cause the problem?